Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast. OSINT for everyone, understanding risks and protecting your data. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speakers are Micah Hoffman and Josh Huff, both SANS instructors and course authors. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Micah. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've got a lot to pack into this next hour. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing that we're going to talk about is who we are. Hang on. Um, I'm Michael Hoffman, as Carol mentioned. I go by the hacker name of Web Breacher, and I am a SAN certified instructor. I just finished creating uh, an OSINT class, which I'll talk about at the end of the WebEx. Uh, but aside from that, I work for the company Booz Allen Hamilton doing uh, things that have to do with cyber, uh, whether it's getting people energized and, and interested in becoming people that, that do work for us in the cyber area or helping people get training or hands-on experience. Um, and within the cybersecurity community, I'm also a pretty big uh, proponent of, of, of people, getting them training and helping them learn and grow. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Huff. My uh, Twitter handle is Beowulf88. Um, I'm a digital forensic analyst. I work for a private investigation firm in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, I try to stay involved with the uh, information security community by doing conference talks, and I also co-organize our local information security meetup here in Columbia called Colasec. I'm also a blogger, so you can see some of my conference talks and my OSINT research at learnallthethings.net. So uh, go ahead and check that out if you get a second. But Keep definitely not for, the next, uh, yeah, <laughs> not, not for the next hour or so. For the next hour, what we're going to do is um, Josh and I got together and we started thinking about how people use OSINT or open source intelligence in their daily lives. And they don't really think about it as doing OSINT. They think of that about it as Google searching or running a DuckDuckGo search or or looking at for a place to go on vacation. They do the activities, but they don't realize that they're actually doing OSINT. So we came up with the idea to, to do this, this presentation to talk about maybe some of the areas of open source intelligence that you as a person out there in, in the world today might not have been introduced to. We're also going to present some of the risks that are associated with those and how you can address them or, or mitigate those risks. Open source intelligence as a whole, uh, the way that we use it here in our society today is, is all about gathering information that's publicly accessible from the internet. Now, you can use open source sources that are not on the internet as well. For instance, court records and documents that you might have to visit a courthouse for, or genealogical records that you might need to visit some church or other organization to find. But for our purposes today, Josh and I are going to focus on the information that's on the internet. They and the information out there comes in different formats, obviously, whether it's videos, images, text documents, even some interactive sites that Josh is going to talk about at the end of the, uh, the WebEx here about doing some remote location reconnaissance, tracking different types of transportation. Now, if you do some research on open source intelligence, you might also see a term called SOC Mint or social media intelligence. And that is kind of a subclass of OSINT that has to do with social media sites. For our purposes, we're going to put them all together and we're going to classify them in the OSINT, under the OSINT moniker. Now, the easiest part about OSINT is usually finding the data. You, there are a variety of search engines out there like Yandex and Baidu, uh, Google, DuckDuckGo, Bing. And there's specialty search engines out there too, like Josh and I are going to talk about later on today in this talk. The hardest part about about doing an open source intelligence investigation is analyzing the data 
figuring out what's true, what's about the thing that you're trying to find out about versus something that's a false positive, something that's distracting. And that's where that's where the intelligence and the true professionals and the people that do open source intelligence for a living, that's where they really shine because they have a bunch of different methodologies and procedures to go through to help sort out things that are maybe opinion from fact, real photos from doctored ones. Additionally, as we know, there are so much information being pushed to the internet every single minute. Uh, there's uh, video, whether it's videos or images or social media, there's sometimes too much information. I did an open source intelligence assessment one time on a person that was named John Smith. His name was actually John Smith. And it was truly overwhelming the amount of information that came back. That was a tough assessment. Now, within open source intelligence, when we do this for a for in, as a profession, we usually work through a methodology or a cycle. Now, this is a very simplified version of the cycle, and depending upon where people are doing the open source intelligence, they will have uh, different cycles and different steps in this process. In general, we have requirements gathering, retrieving the data, analysis, pivoting, and then it goes back to requirements gathering. And each of these steps is very important to the, the overall process and gathering the requirements and starting off the assessment, knowing what you're looking for. I'm looking for John Smith, but I'm looking for John Smith that lives in this very small town in a very distinct location. That can sometimes help narrow the focus of what we're trying to gather. Retrieving the data also is using tools and other processes that we have to, to grab information maybe from less well-known sources, kind of like what Josh and I are going to talk about today. Analyzing the information helps us understand what's truthful, what's opinion, what's been doctored, uh, what's relevant. And then that feeds into, well, you know what, I found some more interesting things. Now I need to go back and figure out what my next steps are. And that's called the pivot. All right, this is Josh again. Uh, I'm gonna show you some examples of some real world pivots. And we'll start with a, what do you see exercise here? Uh, now this photo may look familiar uh, after the false alarm event for the ballistic missile warning that impacted Hawaii. Uh, this photo surfaced of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. Um, a lot of people started playing the game of what do you see and most people keyed into the, the immediate error of uh, post-it notes of uh, passwords on the monitors. Um, one Twitter user, Michael Henriksen, uh, he took his analysis a little further and uh, he wanted to pivot from things that an attacker um, would find interesting. What people did and you can see in the arrows there, the arrows there that they started uh, locating different pieces of information around the photo. Um, there's a high resolution photo out there in circulation that you can actually expand into the details and see for a fact that the phone numbers are visible on that note that's up on the wall there, which would lead uh, pivot points to possibly uh, other workers within the agency or even uh, contacts in the ch chain of command um, along the way, um, as well as even uh, down into the uh, system icons in the uh, tray on the monitor, um, showing things like uh, malware bytes being installed on, on one of the machines. Um, and some people even keyed into things like the books on the desk, uh, which was a, a college level uh, course book uh, indicating maybe that one of the uh, workers could be a college student. Uh, here's another uh, pivot example. This one comes from uh, one of my blog posts actually. Um, the photo on the left uh, came from a news reporter um, trying to tell people about a manhunt that was in progress in Aiken County, South Carolina. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see a manhunt in my area, I like to make sure that it's not too close to my area. Uh, so what I wanted to do was look for something in the photo I could pivot to a geographic location. Now, 
Now, using a partially obscured street sign, uh, which you can see in yellow, um, I took to uh, Google Street Map View and uh, was able to uh, analyze an area I thought might have been right. Um, I was also able to match kind of a unique shaped signpost uh, that's visible in red with the boxes and arrows there um, and determined that the photo was at the intersection of Flint Drive and Dixie Clay Road. Um, so in this case, I was able to uh, pivot from actual features in a photograph uh, to a real geographic location. Uh, in this particular instance, the, uh, the story in Aiken County uh, was several areas away from, uh, from my general location. So I felt better about uh, what was going on in my neighborhood. Thanks, Josh. So those are some examples of pivots. And throughout the talk here, we're going to be talking more about using some OSINT tools that are accessible to everybody and how people might pivot and use that data to find more information uh, about the, uh, a specific target. Let's take a step back for a second and discuss how people use OSINT. Now, some of these, some of these uh, examples that we're going to be using are going to be things that you're absolutely familiar with because you might be a parent or you might be somebody that's used these techniques. But I'm hoping that some of these might be a little bit eye-opening for, for you. For instance, uh, parents, uh, people that are child caregivers, they might use open source intelligence to go online and search for uh, any child, I, I'm sorry, any sexual predators, any sexual, uh, con any people convicted of a sexual crime that are in their location. In the United States, we have national and state databases where you can pull that information up. You might also use it if you're a parent to, to find out information about your children's friends or where they're going. There is location information that sometimes can be uh, sent from ch children's phones or their social media accounts. And then, of course, uh, I haven't been in the dating world in many years, but uh, people tell me that when you actually are, uh, are maybe dating somebody, one of the first things that people do is go ahead to the Googles, uh, look them up, look at their LinkedIn, their Facebook, their Instagram, see what this person's about. What are they posting? What are they tweeting? Uh, to essentially get an in-depth dive into who this person is. A, cor a corollary of that is, is my partner cheating, which can also be a, a um, something that we use open source intelligence for, using pictures, using uh, geolocation, using dates and times of interactions, and who else is at the, uh, certain locations, we can sometimes tie people together, and sometimes there's images of those, uh, those interactions as well. Moving over to the business side, some of you might be in organizations that are using open source intelligence, and again, maybe not calling it OSINT, but um, if somebody applies to your company and you do a Google search on them to find out, hey, uh, do they actually have these uh, certifications or what does their LinkedIn profile look like? Maybe uh, you're looking up uh, corporate rivals and you want to see what the projects that they're working on or at least posting to their Facebook, um, posting to their, their uh, websites are. Or maybe you're looking to find malicious insiders and uh, you're trolling forums online that are places where employees might go to vent about how disgruntled and how upset they are about their company. We've also seen people that actually use open source intelligence, geolocation data, social media information to find employees that, well, just go missing, don't show up for work or don't, don't arrive at the destination to meet with a certain client. We also have the, the idea of, of meeting for, of, of looking up information for mergers and acquisitions. Hey, let me look into that company, who they deal with, what is the online presence of that organization and the things surrounding it look like before we actually purchase it. We also have in investigations for fraud. For instance, if you're an insurance adjuster or you're, um, you're somebody that's a private investigator, there's a lot of information out there about, um, and, and actually YouTube videos too, where people are you know, off of work for disability and they're playing basketball out on their front, on, in their front driveway and such. And then finally, legal support, intellectual property theft, and uh, looking for connections between things that are on the internet and really shouldn't be, and who leaked them. 
Now we've seen also a lot of P, a lot of news organizations shift, especially with the the, the presidency that's here in the United States. Um, over the last year, we've seen a huge shift towards the media using sources like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook posts as primary sources of 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 information. Now that that's right or wrong. I. I'm sorry, right or wrong, it really depends on what the information is out there. We've heard a lot of news about fake news, but yet the information out there can be very raw, up to the minute information. Uh, for instance, when uh, the hurricane came through Puerto Rico, um, Josh and I were, were up late one night and we're watching people do some Facebook live streaming from their phones showing the the carnage that was happening before the power went out. So the media is using social uh, social media and OSINT uh, to fact check, sometimes to show you live images and all. And the one thing that we always have to do is analyze it to see if that information is truthful or whether the source that they got it from was just making up that content. Law enforcement also uses this, and and I love this this slide because law enforcement definitely uses it to uh, find out what gangs are in certain areas, to find out uh, patterns of theft in 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 certain locations. But I've seen a, a trend more often uh, with face with with police offices using Facebook and social media to taunt criminals. Hey, Bob, we saw your picture on the video camera of that liquor store that you just robbed. Why don't you just turn yourself in? And actually, there are instances where Bob or whoever the, the, the suspect is will reply to them and, and have this, this kind of surreal conversation with the police on their social media accounts. Um, in my class, I have a really neat slide where that shows that back and forth across three or four or five posts. And at the end, um, the, the police posted the mugshot of the person saying, uh, Bob won't be on his social media any longer. We don't allow phones in prison. Next, we have intelligence agencies. Now, intelligence agencies use uh, social media. They use other sources of open source intelligence to get information about who's thinking what, about where things are, and uh, about places where they can have interaction. So um, whether it's finding and monitoring terrorist networks in faraway places or even nearby places, or finding out who might have uh, gone ahead and, and uh, executed a cyber attack or some other attack against the facility, going through the steps of the process, using multiple sources of information, and finding that inf that information, it, it can be very helpful to uh, some process that might seek retribution, or either uh, or legal action. Movement of troops and resources. These are great because it's so easy now in in most areas of the world to get uh, really good satellite imagery. And of course, uh, the intelligence agencies don't just use satellite imagery. We can pull images, recent images from people's Facebook, from their from their VK.com social media posts. In fact, the we just saw the Russian government outlawed social media for all their soldiers because the soldiers were taking selfies in Ukraine and other places where Russia was saying, "Hey, we don't have any soldiers there." When you looked at the social media, there's soldiers saying, hey, guess where I am? So it's uh, it's co quite contradictory. The last one's kind of an interesting one here, recruitment of assets. If somebody can find something, I guess, compromising about you, they might be able to turn you to be their asset. We saw this happen when the Ashley Madison uh, uh, online dating uh, site was hacked. The Ashley Madison site was set up for people to cheat on their spouses or cheat on their partners, and people would sign up for accounts there. And when the, that data got released to the internet, we saw a lot of times when people were being blackmailed, trying to be coerced into doing things, and it was really, um, it was not a great time. And that leads us into the OSINT for bad. Uh, these are some things that we've seen in the news. Maybe you've had some personal experience with, um, or maybe you've just heard uh, friends and neighbors that have 
uh, have been um, associated with these these types of attacks. I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, not associated with, but have heard about these attacks. Um, and really, these attacks are going to continue to happen because the amount of information and sensitive information about you, about me, about our friends and family and our coworkers that are out there, um, it's only going to grow in the coming years. So what Josh and I wanted to do was shift gears and talk about some of the data that, that's out there on the internet that we as people in society are pushing out there, that we are, we are willingly submitting to the world. And we call this online data that you have control over. All right, so the things that you share online, uh, they can obviously have a lot of personal data attached to them. Um, social media posts that include you know, photos, text, and videos, um, review websites uh, where you post your comments, um, those can last for years out there. Um, the different connections that, that consist of our digital footprint when we start having all these accounts online. Um, fitness data, uh, which has obviously been a thing recently in the news with all the uh, Strava information. Um, and then just whether or not the geolocation settings are, are broadcasting uh, when we're posting things online. Um, me and Mike are going to cover just a few of these examples uh, in greater detail. So the first one I'll touch on is uh, both Facebook and Snapchat, uh, you have the ability to broadcast your location in a video format. Um, if you're not familiar with it, uh, on the left is a uh, snap map. Um, what that shows is any geographic area in map form, um, you'll see the last 24 hours of public posts to Snapchat. Um, it shows a nice little heat map there. Um, you can move it pretty much anywhere that has online users of the app. Uh, and then over on the right, you can see the uh, Facebook uh, live map. Um, it's a little different in, in showing uh, blue icon uh, beaconing whenever some user is broadcasting uh, live. Um, so you can kind of see different areas start to saturate when stuff's going on. Um, in this example, uh, users were broadcasting during an emergency situation of a very large apartment fire uh, in New York City. Um, this particular situation can actually be beneficial to both uh, the user uh, who may be signaling to uh, loved ones that they're okay, um, as, as well as viewers uh, who can make an informed decision on whether or not to uh, enter an area that may be having an emergency situation like this. Another uh, example of somebody using the uh, Facebook live video feature, um, in this case, they're just driving around and uh, talking to friends. So they're using it for entertainment purposes here. Uh, one thing to note in the uh, red arrow there, this user uh, identifies their area as living in Tampa, Florida. Um, so if you haven't used the Facebook live map before. It looks like the uh, photo on the left there. You're going to have a blue dot beaconing whenever that you're uh, broadcasting uh, a live video. Uh, and in this case, we can overlay it with another map and see that, that this user is actually showing that they're locating uh, somewhere near Tampa, Florida. Um, on quick view of the, the video, um, it may uh, appear that they, they are in Tampa, you know, with the presence of uh, palm trees and, uh, and the geographic area. Now, using uh, audio cues, um, specifically the word Catania that I heard the user say, uh, and then keying into some storefront signs, um, which had some pretty good details visible on the side of a, a building, um, we're able to determine that in this particular case, the uh, user uh, was not in fact broadcasting from Tampa, Florida. Uh, in this case, the, the sign detail was clear enough that we could actually see it as Pharmacia Sandine, 
um, which included a, a phone number proving that the location was in Catano, Puerto Rico. Um, so again, uh, user broadcasting just for fun um, shows enough detail to pinpoint their exact geolocation online. Now, there's other things that, that we push out to the internet too, and sometimes it's not necessarily specific information, but it's it's us aggregating the information about ourselves into a single location. Now, this can be really helpful if you are if you have a professional persona and you are trying to get people to be able to go to your GitHub page to see code that you've written and your LinkedIn profile to see all of the, your work history, and maybe you have a professional Twitter page, tying things together in an about me profile or maybe a keybase.io profile can be very beneficial to your work. However, these sites are wonderful for us to find information about our targets that maybe don't realize that that putting these things together saying hey this is me here's my linkedin here's my twitter here's my instagram here's my facebook that shortcuts a huge amount of the work that we as open source intelligence professionals and that bad guys have to do because if you think about it there's more than one micah hoffman out in the united states there is, trust me, I get one of their mail all the time. So the the Mike, one of the jobs of an open source intelligence person is to say, okay, well, well, is this this is a Micah Hoffman Facebook account, but is it the Micah Hoffman that I care about? And if they use about me or keybase.io and go there and search for Micah Hoffman and they find the webreacher.com website, they know that I go by webreacher, I own webreacher.com domain. So that is probably my profile. And then the accounts there, they can go ahead and use them as pivot points to pull other information about me. And sometimes that's fine. You know, this information is public. Other times you may not want it to be public. And by using sites like these to aggregate data, you're giving uh, away a lot of information. Now let's shift gears to something that's been in the news a lot lately, fitness data. Yeah, so going beyond just Strava and what it does, if we think about the entire class of fitness data applications and software and websites that are out there, they allow us to do a lot of different things as consumers. They allow us to have a support group of friends that help us achieve our weight loss or exercise goals. They allow us to schedule events and compete against other people to challenge ourselves. These are all great things. We're, Josh and I are not saying, you know, don't participate in all. Don't do these things. What we are saying is that when you do participate, you need to think about what is that data? What am I giving away? And what could somebody do with it? For instance, the locations and places where you start and stop your exercises. If you leave the front door of your, door of your house and you hit that, that record my GPS location and you walk your dog or you do your run and then you end it at your house or you commute to and from work via bicycle and every day you're religious and you go ahead and, and clock in and clock out and then that data becomes public, that information about where you work, where you live, where you socialize gets in the hands of people that you probably don't want to have it. And that's exactly what happened with Strava. Strava for years has collected information um, about where people run, bike, swim, walk. It's an exercise tracking application that you put on your phone or mobile device. And then you, you do your exercise, you come back and say, well, there you go, I, I did that exercise. It will map the route that you took. And it's been, they've been doing this for many years. The th problem now is that they've taken that information and they've made public all of the aggregation of it. They've made public a lot of the data points that people thought were kind of being protected. Now, to in Strava's, to Strava's credit, one of the things that they say is, well, you know, you always have had the option to, to turn off the share my data publicly. But the reality is, is that that's an opt out instead of opt in. By default, every account is created with that bit turned on, unless you go in and change it. Let's talk a little bit about this Strava stuff because it's in the news, it's important. And some of you may have heard bits about it, but not necessarily understand the real meaning and the real implications of the data that's out there. 
Now, as I mentioned, the Strava heat map is nothing that it is not new. Uh, they, they've released uh, information several times. The difference now is that they have six times more data. And what we see here is, is uh, um, the map of, of the Strava heat map and the URLs in the, in the image there. And the brighter the line, the more people have run that route. We can see on the left-hand side that I've selected activity types of foot, which is running, heat opacity of 100%. And, and all that means is that those, those lines where people are running are going to really stand out on this map. Well, that's great, right? This is aggregated data. So I can't look at this and go, look, there's uh, John Smith, and, and he runs that route. We can't do that, right? Well, not necessarily. See, the thing about Strava is that it a lot of it, the other activities that people do are public. People don't turn on their Strava security and privacy bits. And so what happens is, is uh, that that data is retrievable. In 2014-15, I gave a talk called Running Away from Security. The YouTube video is right there. Where This was 2014 and 15. So years ago, I gave a talk, and what I did was I, I found places in Strava activities where people were doing patrols. I was like, well, that's a weird name to, to use as a description for a run. So I pulled up that information, and, and I pulled up the activity, and you can see the URL right there. And if you look, this is the Tilbury Power substation in Tilbury, UK. What I found was that there was a huge number of these types of activities in Strava, where a company had decided that their security guards would walk the perimeter of whatever it is that they were trying to protect, and they would use Strava to ensure that they were actually doing that run, that that patrol. And they would put information about who what who did the patrol, when they did it, the time, the date, and that was bad because. The data that was being sent to Strava was not being kept private. I could harvest it. What made it worse was when I revisited that site and I looked at what the heat map showed me, that aggregation of data for the Tilbury Power Substation, what we now see is not just on the, on the eastern side, the rightmost part of the slide, were people walking, but they'd walk along the southern border and then a lot on the left-hand side. This is an aggregation of number of of walks that somebody has done around this substation. And I say around kind of tongue in cheek because because you're probably looking at this slide like I did and go, well, okay, these are security guards. I see them on the left, I see them on the right, but and on the bottom, but I don't see any security guards ever walking along the topmost border, the northern border of this substation. So if you were a crook, and you're looking to break in or you're a vandal and you're looking to do some spray painting, that might be an avenue that you could use. But the heat map data goes even further than that because we can drill down to who did the run, the walk, the bike, whatever. And we do that by using the heat map and drilling down up for a specific activity. Now, as I mentioned, the heat map and the activity data has been out there for many years. What the heat map allows us to do is find activities in places where we wouldn't normally expect activities and then drill down. For instance, this is in Mosul, Iraq. You can see a huge area of blackness there where there are no runs, swims, walks, bike rides. But here, there's a very bright part where the orange arrow is pointing to. And if we drill down, we can see that there is a very regular shape there. You can see straight lines. Nature usually doesn't put straight lines there. Humans put straight lines. So that kind of looks like a self-enclosed area. And if we go ahead and turn on the satellite view, we can see that there's a road nearby. And we can go ahead and, and see, well, let's see if there's roads underneath of the, where people are running. And we do that by hitting the heat opacity at 0%. When we do that, we can see that there are no roads there. Now, this is perplexing, right? Because clearly, if we go back a slide, somebody is running, or biking, what, well, actually running in this case, running along those areas. But if we go forward, there's no roads there. And the reasons for that might be that, A, 
this imagery here that was on that is a Google Maps imagery is is a little bit older and doesn't represent the current state of affairs. Or B, it could be that Google Maps has decided not to update this image uh, because maybe there's a sensitive base there. You know how I know that there's a sensitive base there? I looked. Yeah, this information is out there for, for anybody to pull up. So I found the URL. If you look down there, uh, there's Strava.com segments, 14986. 778, you can pull it up and you could see that's that exact shape. And if you look at it, 170 attempts by 10 people to run that, that base camp perimeter. Oh, thank you very much for noting that this is base camp and you're running around the perimeter of it. So here we have a whole bunch of information, including um, the, the location, we have the, the terrain and the segments. But since there's segments, Strava allows us to compete with other people if you use the app, actual application. And what you could do is you can be the, the champion of running a certain segment. So if we look further, we can drill down on that page and look down there and see who are the leaders that run that segment the fastest or bike that segment the fastest. Now we're starting to dr drill down into real people. This person was at that location at a certain date. Here, June 19th, 2017, Katie Phillips ran an eight minute mile, pretty damn respectable, an eight minute mile running around that base camp perimeter. That puts a person with a location in the middle of Iraq, but it gets better or worse, depending on your perspective. Because if you drill down on that hyperlink there for June 19, 2017, you actually can pull up her page where there's pictures inside of her house, there's her pet, there's other information about her. And you can find other places where she has personal records, where she runs. And it's not just her, there's other people too. This information is out there about millions of Strava users. That's right, Strava has millions of users all around the world. In the headlines, what we see is, oh, United States uh, armed forces are up in arms about because the soldiers are sharing information about where they were, when they were there, where they run. This is giving information to our, our enemies. The reality is, is that this information is not just out there about Americans. Strava is all over the world. In fact, in my talk, I talk about people in Australia that use Strava and other places as well. So with exercise data, we can find out your social networks. We can find out where you go, where you work, where you live, who your friends are, what equipment you use. It's actually quite revealing. Now, that wraps up our online data that you have control over, but that's really just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more out there that you have control over that you can restrict, but Josh and I have a limited time here. So let's switch over to some of this, the information where you don't have control. And I apologize for all the words on this slide. Some of the things that we do as being part of a, uh, uh, a society in 2017, some of the things that we do or that we participate in, some of the governmental organizations that are out there, they publish information about us, our families, our friends that we can't stop from being published. Other things, by just walking around in this world, you are probably being photographed. I live here in the Washington DC area and every time I walk down uh, by the National Monuments, by the White House, by the Capitol, um, I know I'm appearing as a bystander, as an extra in other people's pictures. And for a while, I didn't really care. It's like, oh, you know, they have this bald dude in their picture, woohoo. But now with Facebook, and Google doing facial recognition of content. This stuff is, it can highlight me as a person in a location when I didn't take that picture. So you come to Washington DC, I happen to be walking around, you'd snap a picture, I'm in the background and Facebook goes, hey, that's Micah in the background. Now it might not tell you it's Micah because you and I might not be uh, connected as friends, but Facebook knows. And if Facebook knows, that information can be subpoenaed by the government. Hey, where was Mike on this date? Do you have any records? Oh, he was walking around the mall. Interesting. Um, thank you very much. 
and it's not just Facebook that's doing this, but Facebook has the largest repository of location. I think it was the largest repository of facial shots that have location attached to them. And uh, it's, it's really a huge data source for people to use. Now, another place where we don't really think about a lot is religious newsletters. This might seem kind of silly, but if we think about it, a lot of people in the world are religious and they build these communities where uh, newsletters are generated and they post the newsletters on their websites. These newsletters are excellent sources of information for local information about a person that you're getting, inf about a person that you're researching. If you find that a person is is a member of a certain organization, certain uh, religious group, or certain church, temple, synagogue, you can sometimes go into the newsletters and find interesting stuff about them. Because um, these newsletters have a, a whole bunch of wonderful information. Uh, some of them are listed on the slide. Let's just take a look at them. Google knows, yeah, Google knows that that you can find a whole bunch of information, whether it's church, temple, synagogue, mosque. Newsletters that are PDFs, of course, some newsletters might be in doc format, word format, whatever, but 679,000 documents are indexed by Google that have the word newsletter in them and church, temple, synagogue, or mosque. I'm sure that there's more that are out there. And these newsletters, they they span time. It's not just, hey, this is this month's newsletter. The, the way that the newsletters work is they keep them, they keep an archive of them. Here's our newsletters throughout the year, throughout multiple years. In fact, on some of these sites that I went to, including the, the Lake Placid Synagogue, Grace Lutheran Church, they went back to 2010. Some places go back way further than that. That provides us wonderful amount of history on a person, a family. Think about all the life cycle events that happen within seven years or eight years now. We could have children born. We could have children that, that had uh, other life events, maybe going into the first grade or getting their first baptism or whatever it is. We have weddings. We might even see weddings of these people and then the announcement of their baby across seven years. This stuff's out there. Here's some examples of some of the things that I found while looking through these newsletters. I took about 15, 20 minutes to just grab some random, random places. And uh, look, I've tried to highlight some interesting content here. Um, some of the newsletters posted pictures of people, their addresses, their phone numbers. Um, one of the, the, the images I didn't use just because it didn't fit on the slide was, was new members. And it had their, their pictures. It had their names, their address, their phone numbers, and their emails. And there were a lot of new members of this church for some reason. But it was a wonderful place for, to look for information about open source intelligence. So for religious newsletters, there's a lot of information in there that we can grab. And sometimes it's very helpful to us to, to grab that information. Um, I did one open source intelligence investigation one time and I had very little information about my, my target. Uh, he wasn't on any social media. He was very, uh, very, quiet person, not on the internet and doing a lot of things. And then I found that he belonged to a certain religious organization. I went there, I downloaded all of their PDFs, and then I looked, for, I used a program to pull out information about this person's last name. And what I found was a wonderful array of, oh, this person is is celebrating their the the their wedding anniversary. This person is is now um, mourning the loss of their father, and it has names and information that opened up a, uh, some pivot points to me for that investigation. Josh. Great. So one of the other uh, areas we talked about uh, where you can't control your data so much is uh, real estate info. A lot of property data is considered public record. Uh, so real estate sites uh, such as Zillow.com showed here, uh, they aggregate all this info onto a nice neighborhood map for potential home buyers. Um, this particular example actually gets a little bit worse, though. 
um, the host of that property um, on this example is Turner Properties. Um, it's a rental company. Uh, and one thing that Turner Properties does is uh, record a nice convenient walkthrough of their, their properties. Um, the video is viewable at that YouTube link down at the bottom there. And it's, it's about seven minutes long. They walk the entire exterior, um, including the yards, and then go inside the house and go ahead and touch on every single room just so you can get a nice tour. Um, that picture in the bottom right, however, shows a few things that you may not necessarily want people to know, like the location of your security alarm panel, which is on the right side of that door in the bottom right photo. Now, although you may not live in this exact property, uh, unfortunately, the example gets a little worse again. Um, one thing I was able to do in this neighborhood um, was do kind of a street view walk. Um, now, this is a Bing Maps website, and doing a, a kind of a walk around the neighborhood, uh, I was able to locate another house with the identical um, home front, um, so the same floor plan. Um, once I found that one, I zoomed out and did kind of an overhead view, and I realized that you can see the uh, very distinctive roof shape uh, for any of the houses with that same floor plan. Um, so I zoomed out further and, and very quickly was able to, to decipher 11 identical houses with that same, uh, same floor plan. Um, so a nice convenient video for a rental home um, with that neat little walkthrough, unfortunately could be a guide and, and you want to consider OSINT for bad, maybe a robber is going to case a, a neighborhood and he's got a walkthrough video of 11 homes in that neighborhood um, easily at his disposal there. Um, so that's a, a pretty scary version there. Um, after the scary stuff like that, we'll ease up a little bit and, and talk a little bit uh, of interesting uh, OSINT. Um, now there's a lot of fun tracking websites out there on, on the internet. Um, if you want to find info on trains, planes, uh, boats, satellites, and a whole lot of other stuff, um, you've got access to a bunch of different websites uh, that'll, that'll give you real-time access and tracking um, where you can do a lot of neat things. One of the sites uh, that, that is, is really fun is uh, flightaware.com. Um, now you can see on the left, um, there's going to be some obvious uses. Uh, we can see a, a flight in progress from Washington, D.C. to Orlando, Florida, showing that it's tracking uh, on time. Um, I was able to wave to it from South Carolina about mid midpoint in its, uh, in its path. Um, so these are going to have obvious uses. Now, on the right, you've got a, a formation of a bunch of planes doing loop-de-loops. Um, a little bit more unique there, but if I see a bunch of random planes circling my city, I'm going to probably wonder what's going on. You can pull this and realize that a bunch of them are in a holding formation due to the uh, weather that is passing on the, the right-hand side of that picture. Um, so that's a, an example of kind of a neat tracking that we can do. Another one that is available in most cities um, is traffic cams. Now, the uh, obvious use there is to, to detect and avoid a hellacious traffic jam that you can see here in this uh, Atlanta uh, traffic cam. Um, but some of the more uh, OSINT type uses um, could be used by, uh, say, law enforcement. If there's an amber alert for a missing person, um, the network of cameras scattered around a, a major city like this would do um, a, a lot of use for uh, tracking any kind of a, a vehicle. And in most cases like that, we're given a, a make, model, and color of, of a vehicle that you could potentially use to uh, track down in this. Um, I've actually had a, a case involving the theft of uh, some heavy construction equipment and traffic cameras like this are a great way to find out, you know, where that equipment had been uh, moved to. Um, so things like that can be incredibly useful to an, an OSINT investigator and to an everyday person. I found the uh, traffic cams to be um, so useful. I actually started a uh, collection uh, on a GitHub page here. Um, you can see these at, at the link there, github.com slash Beowulf88 um, under the code name, see all the things. Um, and if you go to that, you'll, you can expand on these entries and, and see the actual um, general location of these cameras, uh, live URL where you can access the stream, 
as well as GPS coordinates uh, in case you do want to uh, to map those those points of interest. Um, so it's another uh, kind of fun example of interesting things online. Now, with all of these things uh, being online, you know, what can we do to make it more challenging for people um, to use our, our data against us? Uh, one example is just making that risk-based decision on how much you want to share online. Um, using the internet is essentially a trade-off of, of sharing some of your information for a benefit. Uh, one example I keep hearing recently in, in ads is this uh, Join Honey program, um, which in, in essence is, is just a simple Chrome add-on that you install to your browser, um, and you're you're basically letting Honey track your shopping history in exchange for access to coupon codes when you're checking out on the different shopping websites. Now, the, um, the ad there shows that over 6 million people are already using this thing, um, but if you take a quick look into the uh, terms of this, you can yeah, very easily see that these guys are, are tracking a lot more than just your shopping history. So. Um, that's one of those where you have to weigh that risk. Do you want to save a couple bucks on your, your shopping in exchange for blowing up your privacy pretty hard? Yeah, the next thing that, that we need to think about is information that's out there that we do have control over that is, uh, is, retreat, is removable. Um, there are websites out there like PIPL.com, people.com, that's them.com, and others that allow people to look up um, your name, address, phone number, who lives with you, all this information. Now, this information is published because, well, you know, we have tax data, we have real estate data, and other information that, that they purchase and they put on the web. We can remove the information from being on the internet uh, by using something like this opt-out doc. Oh, a buddy of mine from work, he created this Google Sheet that has details about how you can go through each of the different uh, sites and remove and take the steps to remove your information. So things are a little bit more private. Now, while it removes that information from being displayed when somebody does a Google, um, when somebody does a search on these sites for Micah Hoffman or whomever, it does not delete the information from the database. That company still has your information, but it's harder for people to get it. Next, we, what we ask you to do is educate others about sharing your data. You know, taking pictures of you and tagging you in the pictures, even though you might be very secure, might have a very restrictive social media profile, if other people are taking pictures with you in it, sharing videos, tagging you, tweeting you, um, GPS locating you, you know, they might be checking into a certain place and saying, hey, I'm with so-and-so then your cover is blown, especially if they're sending it to large social media networks like Facebook and, and others, because that information gets ag aggregated and then tagged to you. So let your friends and family know, hey, I, I really don't want you to share this information about, uh, about me. Next thing is kind of an obvious one. Uh, don't tie your accounts together. Um, if you are a person that has a wide variety of accounts, as I do, um, I do use Keybase.io, but I use that for some of my more professional, more public sites. I don't. I've actually segmented my life to, from personal to public, and that's something else that we suggest is you know go ahead and, and make that divide between your work life and your personal life, and try not to commingle things together because it, it makes it so much more easy when we have. Uh, a site like keybase.io or about.me and we can just find your information and then do all the pivots and grab the data that we need. And the last thing, wanted to do a pitch for my class. If you like this talk, if you like some of the content that we are talking about, this is kind of the things that we talk about in my SEC 487. The URL is right there. That's going to redirect you over to SANS's website. The SEC 47 class is six days. It's hands-on. We've got over 20 labs. It's a fun class. A lot of the examples are based upon the Princess Bride movie, which is one of my favorites. Um, and it's really aimed at you all. 
It's aimed at people that are not highly technical. It's aimed at people that are living in this crazy world that we call 2018. And um, it, right now, we are going. We are scheduling our, the first run of the class, the beta run of the class, in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, on March 19th through the 24th. And in just a few days, uh, on the bottom of the page that uh, that that's on Sans's website, you will see a link to register for that class if you're interested. Um, and with that, uh, I thank you for your time. Uh, I'm going to turn this over back over to Carol to see if there's any questions. Hi, Micah and Josh. It's Carol. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, all right, so we do have a couple of questions that come in. Uh, our first question is, it sounds like there's two kind of combined. Um, I have two questions for the host. How do you protect yourselves from being suspects when performing OSINT assignments and searches for more nefarious topics? Um, secondly, how do you handle foreign language searches when looking for IOCs from Russian, Chinese, or Arabic-speaking countries? Uh, Josh, you want to take the uh, the first one? How do you protect yourself? Yeah, um, in most uh, OSINT investigations, uh, I typically am going to run research from um, SOC accounts, um, which are accounts registered under a different name um, or a research account that's built specifically uh, without any of my identifiers uh, tied to it. Um, now that could be an, uh, a class or a talk all in itself because the, the rules of that game change from site to site and from week to week on how you can make those um, as people crack down on false accounts. Um, but then there's also things like uh, protecting yourself with uh, VPNs, which can help mask your uh, IP address. Um, but in general, those are the, the main um, precautions that I take to to help kind of cover my tracks when I'm doing an investigation. Yeah, and and like Josh said, I I, I agree with him. Uh, the the how do I protect myself? How do I keep myself safe? How do I make sure that they don't know it's actually me that's on these forums? Um, that is that's a, a large portion of of my class, and it's a huge uh, topic because some OSINT is entirely passive. And some you may be taking on a persona and have to participate in forums or other places, and it can be challenging. The other part of that question about language, there's a lot of languages, language tools online um, and on mobile devices that can help you do some translations. Now, it won't necessarily allow you to do live translation of text as it's typing, although I just was in Skype and I noticed that there's a Skype um, a conversation um, there's a Skype uh, user account there that you can add to a three-way chat and one person could be typing in one language. It will translate that while it, it's type, being typed into your language. Probably not usable for an OSINT investigation, but um, the language tool sites at uh, Google Translate, uh, Microsoft's Translate, and the apps associated with that are actually quite good at at doing that. But as Kirby Plessis, uh, one of our good friends, points out, there's no substitution for having somebody that understands the language and the nuances of that language. All right, thanks. Um, Micah, as we talked about, someone noticed that the SAN site says, sorry, this course is not currently available. So I yep. let that attendee and wanted to tell the group, um, you'll receive an email when this course becomes available. And it should be just in the next couple of days. We're just finalizing the hotel and everything. So um, it's going to be great. All right, great. Um, someone asks, you mentioned OSINT as possible source for HR recruiters and such. You didn't mention this might be a violation of GDPR when done in the, in the EU. Also, are there certain restrictions in the US for this matter? You're absolutely right, and I will start out by saying I am not a lawyer, um, and that each organization that uses OSINT uh, in pre-employment screenings needs to talk with their legal team to make sure that, one, the organization is comfortable with what's happening, and two, they're not violating any local, state, or federal laws. Uh, the EU privacy laws are very strict about what can and cannot be done, um, so you're absolutely right. In other parts, parts of the world, there aren't such restrictions and people may be doing that. So that's why we bring it up because this is a global world and sometimes it's uh, uh, we need to look at things from different perspectives. But make sure before you do it for screening that your legal team knows what you're doing and approves. Thanks, Maka. Uh, 
someone comments that it doesn't look like the uh, v.osint.ninja uh, website works. Is there a different link or? So the OSINT Ninja website is really, the the.osint.ninja is just a bit.ly URL director, a redirector. So the OSINT Ninja won't take you to a website. It'll send you to, to bit.ly. You need that opt out doc to tell it where to send it on, where to send it, uh, where to send you once you get to Bitly. All right, thanks for clarifying. Um, someone asks, what about using Sock Puppet account for online privacy? Josh? Yeah, uh, Sock Puppet use uh, has a lot of different um, applications, I would suppose. Um, un unfortunately, some of my uh, cases have led me to try to detect whether or not the person on the other end was a real user. Um, and in short, because they were on a, a Sock account. So um, you can use it to protect your, your identity. Um, and you just have to be careful with that. Again, there's a lot of nuances that go into making a successful SOC account. Uh, in some cases, I can actually link SOC accounts to real people if, if they were sloppy in the registration of it. So you definitely have to be careful doing that. Yeah, and, and I'll add on to that too. Uh, it's not just the the people that use the site that might be able to connect a user to another account. If you're not careful, I was making some sock puppets for the, the, the class that I, I've created here. So I wasn't being careful on purpose, but I started getting emails to my email address saying, hey, do you know this other person? And it was that actual sock puppet account that I just created a Facebook account for because the IP addresses for our network traffic were the same. So they figure it and Facebook might figure or LinkedIn might figure that uh, since both of these people are coming from the same Verizon Fios uh, house, maybe they know each other. So you have to be careful for that too. And that kind of points back to what one of the other participants asked about using a VPN. Um, I know some people that do OSINT that have one VPN, one setup, one system per SOC account. So uh, for persona, per, per persona. So if I have a persona for John Doe, he'll use one VPN that goes out through Canada and he'll have these accounts. And then if I have another sock puppet, I'll choose a different VPN provider with a different operating system on a different computer to, to keep everything totally safe and, and separate. And even then, as Josh points out, there still can be connections. All right, thanks. Maybe we can squeeze in one last question. Um, any tips for DLP leakage? We normally Google search sites like Dropbox for things like our company name. Yeah, so I'll take this and then I'll hand it over to Josh too. Um, so there are actually alerts. Uh, if you, um, some of the site, sites like Pastebin have alerts that will let you know when when something has been leaked. DLP um, allows you to understand where your documents are going, so you can you can search for them. Uh, other things like uh, Microsoft, if you have your your documents in Microsoft's cloud, I believe they have some really good DLP. Um, tools in, that can help understand where and keep those documents from being removed from the cloud. But uh, aside from using tools to enumerate pastebin sites and other places like that, and using the alerts that are um, that you can set up, um, Josh, would this be maybe a case where we could use like an if this then then that type of automation, or? Yeah, some of the automation protocols and even uh, just some of the, the more simple um, like Google alerts that you can set up for different, um, you know, company names, employee names. Um, and if you find a site that is known to, to drop those leaks, um, sites like changedetection.com where you can track changes on a specific website um, just to give you a notification when there's new data on there could, could come into play for stuff like that. All right, well, that concludes our webcast. Thank you so much, Micah and Josh, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcast. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.